All right, welcome back to Word of Your Ear. We don't have the usual lineup this evening because Mark Ellen is temporarily indisposed. So his part will be taken by me um, in solo. And uh, I welcome to our guest this evening, Daryl Bullock, who is the author of The Velvet Mafia, The Gay Men Who Ran the Swinging Sixties. Hello, Daryl. Nice to see you. Hello, Dave. Nice to see you. Well, nice to hear you as well, Dave. <laughs> nice yeah. to hear you. Yeah, we've, had, we've had a few glitches, but we're fine now. The thing, I was thinking about this book today, and um, it struck me, you know, in 2021, um, nobody has any difficulty understanding what this book is about. Sure. But the curious thing is, back in the 1960s, people would have had great difficulty. <laughs> Uh, telling you what it was about because you know i'm old enough to remember the 1960s and the interesting thing about the 1960s is gay wasn't invented it just it it, it wasn't you know it wasn't conceded whatsoever in uh, in polite society so why don't you just start by telling us a bit about the background of the 1960s as far as gay living was concerned and then sure. where these particular characters fit in sure well um there was there was a a lgbtq life as we call it now a, a gay life a homosexual life in britain and, and actually you know in all the kind of developed countries in the world um as far back as the 20s and 30s and even before that but as always happens in times of austerity, in times of, you know, warship and hardship, everything goes back underground in, during the Second World War. And it takes a long time to come back out into the open. So we've got in, in London, you've got um, cabaret stars happily kind of, you know, mincing around and camping it up all over the place getting arrested, you know, for, for all sorts of nonsense in cars with half, half dressed sailors and all sorts going on. And then, and then nothing in the 40s and 50s until rock and roll. Um, rock and roll happens in Britain in 1956, thanks in part to this gay Jewish clothier called Larry Parnes, who right. has been on the periphery of, um, of showbiz for a little while now. He'd had an affair with an American singer called Johnny Ray, who's kind of a precursor to a lot of the rock and roll stuff that's happening. Um, huge, huge star in his, in his enormous star. Absolutely. And, and that whole, you know, um, the Morrissey th thing with, with the, the hearing aid and everything, that's all Johnny Ray. That's all based on him. Um, so Larry was on the periphery of theater. He, he'd invested in a couple of kind of small plays that got some notoriety, but didn't make much money. And then a photographer from a newspaper called the daily sketch comes along, a guy called John Kennedy and says to him, I've seen this kitty down a Soho coffee shop, and I think he's got something. Do you want to come and see? So they rock off to, um, it's always said it's the two eyes, but it's not the two eyes. I think if I remember rightly, it's the Gar and Gimbal, or it's the, the coffee shop. The, the coffee shop's around there anyway. Um, and he sees Tommy Steele. And the rest is history. So he, right. <laughs> he signs Britain's first genuine rock and roll star in 1956 he and kennedy together are seals co-managers and the whole thing kicks off so there is a kind of cliched view of the of the kind of the role of the gay manager in in developing male pop stars yeah which is that the that the the, the gay manager sees the potential talent through the same lens as as a teenage girl fan would see them was that was that the case with tommy Steele? i i think there's a there's a certain element of that absolutely and if you look at people like larry pines and then later brian epstein and, and robert stigwood and so on and so on they are definitely looking at these potential acts or these 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 people they want to sign in a very different light to um other people in the business were looking at them um and they probably wouldn't have signed people like Tommy Steele and, you know, Marty Wilde and Billy Fury and, and those kind of people without having that 
idea of how they can market them. I don't necessarily think it's just, you know, these guys, these guys are, are seeing themselves as teenage girls and they're totally in thrall of, of these, you know, incredibly handsome young men, but they are, they're, they've come from middle class backgrounds that, that have a have a grounding in retail and they can see how to market something right. they know they're on the cusp of something new so this is you know this is all brand new there were no pop stars and rock stars in britain before now so they, they can see something new's happening they, they're on that uh, to use that horrible word zeitgeist of what's going on and they can see a way of uh, promoting and and pulling this thing this new music this rock and roll out there and making it pay for itself rather than just you know kids sitting in corners of coffee shops with you know acoustic guitars earning you know six pence a time right right now larry palms very quickly became a kind of uh, it was almost a comic type wasn't it you know because i there's a very famous peter sellers um sketch which you no doubt know where where he, he um he portrays uh the, the, this military figure i think who who lives in a house in the west end full of uh you know uh, desperately um you know fame hungry youngsters and i think it was the famous line what are you doing here i've told you where the carpet begins you end <laughs> Very nice. how, much, how much of that has got any kind of foundation in the kind of relationship that Larry Palms had with his stable? And tell us about the stable and how that worked. Well, Larry, want, Larry was fashioning himself on the only superstar manager that anybody had ever heard of at that time, and that's Colonel Tom Parker with Elvis. There were no major managers before then. Nobody had ever heard of anybody, and nobody had seen anyone kind of fashioned this rough piece of clay into a, into an international star before. Yeah. So he's trying to, he's, he's, he's using Colonel as a model. So he's seeing the deals that are going on. We're getting an idea of the deals that are going on and he's taking as much as he absolutely can, just like the Colonel did with Elvis. But his, the big difference here is he doesn't see one act, one artist. He sees all these kids hanging around Soho desperate for fame. And he thinks, ah, hang on a minute. If I can do it with this one, I can do it with that one. And if I can do it with that one, I can do it with that one. So after Tommy Steele, you've got, he signs his brother, Colin Hicks. He signs Marty Wild. He signs Billy Fury. He signs a bunch of guys like um, Johnny Gentle and um, um, Vince. Vince oh, Eager. Vince Eager, thank you very much. Um, who don't quite have the same kind of, the same kind of careers. But he's he signs a whole bunch of people who he can package up, shove on a stage, and suddenly start touring around the country. And that did not happen before. Right, we didn't right. have rock and roll tours in the same way that we, you know, we, that they had in the states, and we see now at, the, at that time. You used to have you know weekends in in Blackpool with a bunch of people and performing dogs and and whatever yeah. in the middle of it. You'd have you'd literally have. Tommy Steele's, or, or sorry, Larry Parnes's uncle Len doing his oh, little turn. So they, there was a bit of showbiz in Larry Parnes's background, wasn't he? His uncle, tell us about his uncle. Uncle Len the Singing Fool. <laughs> the Singing Fool. <laughs> so he, he was just him on one of his rock and roll tours, didn't he? He Later did. On. He, he's on the first Tommy Steele tour. He, he's, he's one of the support acts. So before the idea of a, of a rock and roll package comes together, which again is Larry seeing what's going on in the States with things like, you know, the Buddy Holly, uh, big bopper tour. Um, he's sending people out in the way that you send people out in Britain. So that was, you know, a singer, a comedian, a performing dog act, somebody yeah, doing yeah. impersonations, a ventriloquist act. And then you might get your teen heartthrob on at the last, for the last quarter of an hour to do three yeah. songs. It's, right. uh, it, it was a really strange situation. Val Dunican was going out on tour with these kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. It's mad. Yeah. Tell me about the the the, the naming of, of these people. You know, gentle, eager, steel, sure. wild, and so forth. Because there always used to be this joke that, uh, apocryphal story, that he bedded all these people and then gave them names that kind of chimed with their 
performance in the sack. It's a lovely story. It can't be true, can it? It's not true. It's not true. Um, what a shame. It's not true. The, the, the closest we get to that is a story that Simon Napier Bell tells um, of all these young guys hanging around Larry's ha Larry's flat. And if he liked you, you got a nice clean white T-shirt. And if he didn't like you, you got a black T-shirt. And then you were fair picking for anybody else that happened to be around. Larry <laughs> tried to bed a lot of people. He tried with Vince Eager. He tried with Georgie Fame. He tried with Tony Sheridan, who, of course, you know, famously played with the Beatles in Hamburg and recorded with the Beatles. Um, but once you told Larry, no, that was it. He backed off. He, he wasn't right. predatory in that way. Yeah. This idea that he was this kind of lechy little man desperately, you know, trying to get into everybody's pants is just nonsense. Larry's right. major motivation was money and okay. and making a name for himself. So, but he'd try on a, you know, if you're, imagine you're a straight guy with all these young girls coming in saying, you know, I want to be a star, please. That's what mm -hmm. happened. That's what yeah. people did. You tried it on. Larry, if you told him no, he stopped. He backed off. There's absolutely zero evidence of Larry being more being anything like predatory. The thing that one of the things that intrigues me about this is, and this kind of applies to the the next person to talk about, who is Brian Epstein, which is that that because gay didn't didn't exist, as I jokingly said at the beginning, the average the average guy in a band was probably not very aware of. Uh, the uh, of the gay world and that and that the potential manager might be gay and, and and might have designs on them or whatever i mean is that fair to say they were quite naive about this i think that's very fair to say depending on where you came from um the idea that john lennon was naive about sex is just ridiculous you know night right. john lennon was hanging around gay bars in in liverpool before he signed or before the beatles signed with brian so the thought that Lennon didn't know is just nonsense. But certainly someone like Vince Eager, who came from Nottingham, 17 years old, knew nothing about anything. And suddenly, you know, Larry's offering him, you know, his bed to share. Yeah, absolutely. It's new. Um, right. It's it's a scary world to suddenly to walk into and to have the wherewithal to say, no, not going there. Not interested. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, people would absolutely would have taken advantage. But. Just because uh, LGBTQ people were kind of forced to live their their social lives underground in a kind of, you know, um, surreptitious manner, it doesn't mean it didn't exist. You know, homosexuality was not invented with Stonewall or 1960s, you know, the 1967 Wolfman Report. People yeah. were conducting their lives in this clandestine manner, clandestine manner, um, out of the spotlights. But it was a kind of open secret in a lot of places. You, you, you. Ha there's um something in the book I've written about um the green room at uh, Ready Steady Go, where pretty much everybody was anybody was hanging around there, and they were kind of using it as a, as a you know place to meet before going off clubbing or or to their you know gambling dens or wherever at the uh, later in night. And it was full of of gay songwriters, gay managers, gay label heads, all these people who were who not only knew each other, they were, they were not only working together in a business capacity, but they were supporting each other socially as well. Right. Right. So let's talk about Brian Epstein, sure. who is a fascinating character. Mm. His whole life was a kind of desperate search for some kind of thing that he could be really good at. And then he yep. was suddenly really good at it. And, um, but before that, he'd, um, you know, he came from a very similar background to Larry Palms, really, yeah. didn't he? Jewish, very successful retail family, wanted the best, probably wanted him to get married, probably saw that as the kind of future. And then everything he tried before the Beatles failed, didn't it, really? He joined the army, he was at RADA. Tell us about that. What was the gay element of that? Well, he didn't join the army. He was, he, we were still in conscription, so he was conscripted. He didn't have any choice, you know, and, yeah. and, and didn't last very long. I think 10 months, wasn't it, something like that, if, if that. Yeah. Um, Brian sought Larry out. When Larry came to Liverpool in 1959, so two years before he signed the Beatles, Brian sought Larry out to get advice from him. Oh, really? the, 
the homosexual community is very tight knit. The Jewish community is very tight knit. If you know what's happening, you hear names, you, you're on, you know, you've got your finger on the pulse. Larry's name was being spoken about. Larry had already been um, kind of, yeah, had had jokes made about his sexuality in, in, I think it was the NME, in as early as 1956. So people knew. So there was no, there was no, Brian purposely sought him out to get advice from him, just in the way that Larry modeled himself on the Colonel. Brian was looking for an inroad into something in show business, having, as you said, gone to RADA, and that all fell to pieces when he got arrested for, for cottaging. Um, tried kind of local amateur dramatics, but decided he was probably a bit too long in the tooth and didn't really enjoy it anyway. He was taking speech therapy, you know, speech lessons, um, trying to sort himself out and give himself some kind of um, uh, find a way into show business in some way or another. And and as I said, even two years before signing the Beatles, he was still looking at a way into that world. I think if it hadn't have been rock and roll and pop, then it probably would have been the theatre in some way. And I, I don't see him as an actor, um, no. maybe as an artist manager or, or, or a manager, a, a theatre manager, a, a stage manager, whatever. But then, you know, he happens on the Beatles. The Beatles have and been... And he falls you know, in love with them, doesn't he? It's sorry. No exaggeration. It's no exaggeration to say he falls in love with the Beatles. I don't mean no, calmly. No. He, he loved them, didn't he? Oh, he adored them, and they adored him. They, there was, it was a, it was very much a, a two-way love affair. They absolutely adored Brian, and they stuck up for Brian whenever it was any questions came up about him or his sexuality or later his drug taker or anything else. Brian was untouchable. They could make as many jokes as they liked. John could, John was withering and, and nasty at times towards him, but that's because they were friends and they could do that. You do that from outside the circle, you're immediately banished. Yeah. There's a um, story that in I know we're jumping forward a bit, but in '67, when George Harrison is in is in LA writing, you know, and writing Blue Jay Way and, and stuff like this, and they're they're getting Apple together. Um, Nilsson uh, comes to the house because George wants him wants him to join Apple, and Nilsson says something along the lines of, "I don't want to be married, uh, managed by a fag." And George yeah. throws him out of the house. Yeah. You know, they were yeah. seriously loyal as far as Brian Brian was concerned. And that's one of the reasons why when there was this idea that Brian may hand over the reins of NEMS to Robert Stigwood, they refused point blank and said, if you try to do that, we'll just record, you know, God Save the Queen for every record until, we, until you know, you release us from our contract. Mm. They, they adored Brian, each other. Brian had a... Had a it, it was a strange combination because he was immensely discreet in his professional life, but wildly indiscreet in his personal life. Is that fair to say? For a period, yeah, absolutely. I, he became more discreet later, but he was um, he was desperate for um, acknowledgement. He was desperate to be part of that circle. So as soon as he met the Beatles, as soon as he thought this was his kind of, I don't want to say meal ticket because that, that's really underplaying what he did. But as soon as he saw that they as a unit, as a five piece, Brian and the four of them could move on, for, could move forward. He wanted to ingratiate himself as much as he, as much as he could, even to the point of buying himself the leather suit and hanging around, you know, the gay bars in Liverpool in this leather suit looking utterly ridiculous. Um, right. Brian really, Brian saw them as this tight little unit and that he wanted to be part of. He suddenly had, you know, he immediately had four friends who would stand up for him, which he hadn't had before. He'd had one friend, maybe two friends, if he was lucky before that. He was going out, he was getting beaten up, he was getting blackmailed. Um, it's a very famous case in 59 in Liverpool where he's dragged through, the, he has to go through court because he's been beaten up in Sefton Park by a, a, a trick he's picked up that night. Um, he's he's constantly in trouble until he finds what he's looking for, which happens to be these four guys playing in the cavern. Uh, yeah. One of the figures who's, who's fascinates me, who's threaded all the way through this book, is David Jacobs, mm. not the disc jockey David <laughs> Jacobs. But explain David Jacobs, the lawyer, 
who everybody who seemed to cross the path of absolutely mm. everybody at the time tell us about him david jacobs not the david jacobs the, the bbc the radio 2 presenter uh was the go-to showbiz lawyer he had um he'd looked after he'd kind of shepherded the famous liberace case when liberace sued the daily mirror because they did suggest he might be homosexual and then he won <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> which you know we look back it's at it now, think, funny just, now isn't it? <laughs> it's painfully ridiculous but but at the time you couldn't dare say that about somebody when when it was suggested no. about that uh it was suggested that larry may possibly be homosexual in the enemy he threatened to sue them it was going you know you didn't do that no, so no. jacobs was at the center of showbiz in 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 london his father had been um showbiz lawyer he'd been um, lawyer to uh michael balkan um the, the film producer director and through the business jacob starts to meet a lot of showbiz people and a lot of um upper class um social the social elite i suppose we call it in london he's picking he's, he's hanging around with uh, winston churchill's niece or uh, granddaughter sarah he's he's got he knows opera stars he knows singers he 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 becomes friendly with judy garland and because she's backwards and forwards from the states at this time larry and he become friends and become business partners for a while so when brian moves to liver moves from liverpool to london larry immediately suggests that he goes to david jacobs for his legal advice and for any legal help rather than running back to liverpool to ask rex macon here yeah. here's the guy to go to you know he is the one and he you know uh diana doors was on his books roger moore was on his books um trevor howard was on his books everybody that was anybody in showbiz knew or worked with david jacobs at some point it's just extraordinary they, they i was uh, looking at the pictures today of when ringo and yeah. maureen got married in 1965 yeah. january 1965 yeah yeah and maureen is pregnant and 18. yeah they don't decide to go on the honeymoon so the honeymoon is in david jacobs back garden in hove isn't it that's right yeah in hove um and they've well, only got four days anyway because ringo's got to go off to the bahamas is it to film help so they've only got like four days it's absolutely <laughs> extraordinary the the, the people that, that uh, david, david jacobs deals with doesn't he do when donovan gets busted for was it drugs wasn't it it was something yeah. before drugs i can't remember what it was he was yeah, he I'm, was the he, person the flash showbiz lawyer was the guy that you got wasn't it it really was i think i think the first the first, before donovan's drug bust it's the scooter bus where he's he, he's he's riding a scooter around london he's never passed a test or whatever it is and he gets done for that but um yeah it's donovan and it's and it's you know patty and jenny boyd and it's so it's it's all the the bright young things everybody who's anybody is going to david jacobs because he's so well connected he's got a fearsome reputation for getting people off or getting people you know uh, getting away with fines rather than going to prison for a lot of people so he's he is the go-to guy um and it's you cannot have a showbiz story in london without david jacobs so it's kind of weird that people haven't written about him before because he's yeah. so important no it is surprising now one of the things i like about your book is that it as you've referred to in our conversation you know that it, it links these figures who appear to come from different eras mm. it makes clear that they don't really that they cross over with each other and one of the pivotal figures here is is joe meek mm. you know who's kind of between the 50s and the 60s isn't he really and he is he's a curious man isn't he joe meek tell us about him I, i've always found joe meek an absolutely fascinating character maybe it's partly because he came from gloucestershire where i'm originally from right. um but it, and, and maybe it's because he made some stunningly brilliant records as well as an awful lot of dross um but i i, I think joe is such a complicated character because the guy was clearly incredibly talented but he he had so many problems joe's biggest problem I, I think you know other biographers have said this about him in the past he was more than likely bipolar but it was never um diagnosed 
We didn't yeah. talk about mental health issues in those days in the same way that we do now. And so yeah. people who did suffer with depression and, and bipolar issues and stuff like that, they tended to self-medicate. Joe, Joe threw gob loads of pills down constantly and he, and he was always wired and he was always getting into arguments and he, and he would switch like that from, from being very local and, you know, Gloucester and very sorted to being a complete psychopath mm. just to say the wrong word to him. Um, but, you know, Telstar, you know, what a record. Yeah. Uh, all, all those, you know, all those early, late fifties, early sixties, the, 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 the blue men, I hear, a, I hear a new world album, all those kind of things. Joe was visionary, but he was really, really messed up. Um, maybe if he'd have got some, you know, some good help, he might not have, you know, turned his shotgun on his landlady and then on himself. Yeah. Who knows? yeah. Now, Robert Stigwood is, mm. is a person, you know, everybody thinks of as the great impresario behind Saturday Night Fever and Grease and, Derek the Dominoes and the whole empire is no longer with us now. But uh, but as you point out in your book, he had a he had a, a, a far rockier road to success, didn't he? He he was there in the early sixties, wasn't he, in, in London? Uh, Stigwood's story is really interesting. Well, they're, they're all really interesting, you know. That's kind of why I write about stuff because it's interesting. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> but what what gets me about Stigwood is is if you look at his career. There are three kind of definite periods where he's doing really, really well. And each time he's got somebody else looking after the purse strings. Right. He's rubbish with money. He hasn't got a clue. He's terrible with money. And he's an inveterate gambler. He's If you put cash in his pocket, it's, it's gone on, on a game of cards or it's lost completely. Um, but every time he's got somebody else clutching the purse strings, writing the checks, looking after the finances, he does really well. He signs, you know, obviously he signs the Who to his own record label, Reaction, but sort of before track. So before, um, you know, Kit Lambert and, and Chris Stamper set up track. Um, he signs Paul Nicholas as an actor and singer years before he becomes famous. He's working with people at Bowie before he's famous. But he's also signing a lot of he, – he's, he's got John Layton at number one. He's got um, Mike Sarn at number one. <clears throat> But he also signs a lot of absolute drivel, partly because, you know, he fancies them. And uh, that's abundantly clear from some of these stories. He signs some complete no-hopers who don't stand a cat in hell's chance of having a hit. But they're good looking, you know, and Robert likes yeah. a good looking boy. Um, but he, he keeps missing the boats. And it's um, his business partner in the early 60s, a guy called Stephen Kamlosi, who... Um, later, he's still around today. He he's married now to Patty Boulay. If you remember Patty Boulay from the seventies oh, and eighties, yeah, yeah. yeah. He um he said to me that you know Robert's problem is he just didn't see things coming. You you had to kind of smack him around the head and tell him what was happening. So he they missed out on the beat boom by about a year because Robert was fixated on signing solo acts, yeah. you know, mostly boys because they were cute and trying yeah. to market them as the new Cliff Richard two, three, four years after Cliff had hit his peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we we come to the end, you know, it, it, as you get towards the end of the 60s, when's the, when's the, when's the change in the law as uh, pertaining to homosexual relationships? Is that 67, 68? 67, yeah. 67. 67. And so... But it's still not above ground, is it, is it at all? And that's the, one of the interesting things to me is, is, I think it was 1970 when David Bowie turned up on the the front page of, of the Melody Maker or the NME or whatever it was, wearing a gown, you know. And, and, and it suddenly became acceptable to call yourself bisexual, didn't yeah. it? Nobody, it was very nobody said that. There wasn't, a, there wasn't an out gay performer, was there? Even no, um, Dusty Springfield starts to talk about his sexuality in an interview for with um, the Evening Standard. Um, Ray Coleman, Ray Connolly, I always get those two confused. Yeah. 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 Well, no, he was the editor of Melody Maker. Anyway, go on. she starts yeah. to suggest that that you know she that she might be bisexual, and then isn't it? yeah, and then eighteen months later, David in that famous interview says, you know, I'm gay, and I always have been, even when I was David Jones, I was gay. 
and that's 1971. Um, Post-67, post the Wolfenden Report, there's very little change. There's big change with the Beatles, you know, with Brian dying and 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 yeah. so on and so on, and, and Joe Meek dying and Joe Orton dying and all that stuff happening. Yeah. But there's very little change um, in the LGBT community, if you like, um, until 69 with Stonewall, then 70 with that kind of awareness of sexual politics. It's all very much tied up with with women's liberation. The, the gay liberation movement is very is intrinsic yeah, yeah. to women's liberation and 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 black liberation as well. So all these things are coming along. The student rights in '68. It's it's all part of a much bigger picture where everything's starting to change. Then, but you're absolutely right. Um, 1971, 72. It's incredibly. Um, um, fashionable to say you're bisexual, and lots of people are saying, you know, Freddie Freddie Mercury suggests he might be bisexual. David says he's gay, and then he's bisexual, and then he's straight. Mark <laughs> Boland says he's bisexual eventually. Elton John says he's bisexual. Um, the only person prior to that who'd actually stood up and said I'm gay, but nobody was paying any attention, was Long cool. John Baldry, maybe. Yes, you know? that's. <laughs> who's actually making records about being gay later, but, you know, and, and but he was also dealing with his own, you know, mental health issues. <laughs> no, I can remember it. Funny this, you know, in the late 70s, 77, 78, I was dealing with bands, and then somebody said, the guitarist, he's gay. And, and it was kind of not a shock, but it was a surprise because the... the that somebody didn't make an issue of it at all, you know. We were, whereas clearly there were loads of gay musicians, mm. you know, dotted throughout groups all the, at that time, but nobody was talking about it. Well, they couldn't it, talk it, about it because if you wanted to get a record career, if you wanted a contract, you yeah. wouldn't get signed. It was yeah. it was assumed for year and for another ten years after that, it was assumed that if you came out, you would lose your audience. That's yeah. why, you know, in 1985, the Frankie guys are told not to tell people they're gay when they go to the States. That's why yeah. Boy George doesn't come out for years. That's why Mark Almond is told, don't tell people you're gay. Mark Almond, Mark Almond, who's, you know, who's parodied on, you know, not the nine o'clock news, is yeah. told, don't tell people you're gay. It's just ludicrous when you think about it. But the yeah. assumption was from, you know, from your CBSs and your EMIs and everybody else, that your career was over if you dared to say that you were gay, which patently is untrue. Audiences are much more savvy than record companies have given ever given them credit. Yeah. Well, um, there it is, the Velvet Mafia, the gay men who ran the swing in the 60s. We've only, we've only touched on some of the characters in here. Uh, and there are a million stories in the Naked City, as they used to say, and we've just told a few of them. Daryl, what's next? You've written quite a few books with this kind of background, haven't you? You've written uh, you're, you've written David Bowie made me gay, a hundred years yeah. of LGBT music. What's next? Well, I've got a book coming out next year, which is already written, so it's being edited now. This should the Velvet Mafia should have been out last year, but because oh, of COVID right. and everything, it, it's it's been it's been delayed a while. It's given me plenty of time to work on other stuff. Okay. I've got a, I've got. A, I've got a book coming out next year, which is uh, tentatively called Pride, Pop and Politics, which looks at a 50 year history of the LGBTQ movement in Britain, because that will come out next year in 22, which is the 50th anniversary of the first ever Pride March in London. So right. that's that. But again, because everything I do is involved with music in some way, it's 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 about the music and the musicians and all those acts that used to play early gay lib uh, benefits and 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 like Bowie did. Bowie Bowie played a very early gay lib benefit. Um, and then I've got something in the pipeline for maybe three years' time. Once that's out of the way, <laughs> but it'll be similar. It'll be similar, but and a different once, era. And once, as we like to say on these podcasts, when this bloody war is over, you know, uh, and we're all out there. Very nice to talk to you, Daryl. There's the book, available when the bookshops open, but no doubt available online and all the usual outlets currently. It's been very nice to talk to you. you Thanks too. very much for joining us. And uh, all the very best with it.